What's going on, YouTube? Culture Dog Sam Hatch back here with another Laserdisc Spotlight review. And uh, don't worry, I got a, even more coming after this and uh, some other big Laserdisc related videos that I've been working on behind the scenes throughout all of these, which I've been hinting at a little bit over time. So that's still coming. Don't worry. Um, but yeah, it's just I've been trying to randomly watch this. It's funny because during this whole, you know, lockdown quarantine thing, um, I haven't had any extra time really than I normally would. Uh, so this may seem like I've been just, you know, taking the opportunity to watch as many laser discs as possible. But uh, no, I've been, uh, unfortunately, I still, you know, <laughs> I mean, not unfortunately, but I've still been working full time and um, I've been just as busy, if not more than ever. Um, but no, I just, at the same time, this all kind of went down. I made a concerted effort to start firing up more laser disc reviews, uh, reviews for the, you know, the ones I have been watching. So, you know, every once in a while late at night, I'll throw on a laser disc and I'd never report back to you guys on it. So I figured let's, uh, you know, start making that more of a regular thing. And um, one is a title that, yeah, how, how can I not have done a review on this yet? And there's more to come because there's a, a sweet box set, which I need to go over at some point too. Um, and then the rest of the series, because it is a franchise, but of course we're talking back to the Mickey Ficky future. It's a must have laser disc. Uh, this is one of the you know, two trilogies that people uh, signed up for uh, the most from uh, Columbia House's Laserdisc Club uh, because you could get three introductory Laserdiscs for a dollar a pop. Of course, they charge you through the roof for shipping and they don't combine shipping. So that's where they made made their money. So you weren't actually getting you know, three movies for three dollars. It was actually a little pricey, uh, but not that bad. It was still less than the cost of one of these discs. But uh, the two best ones to get were, of course, the Star Wars trilogy and Back to the Future. And I may or may not have signed my parents up <laughs> for alternate Columbia House accounts so I can get more. Uh, so yeah, the first time I, I got the CBS Fox or the Fox Video um, widescreen versions of the Star Wars trilogy, and then the third time I signed up, I got the Faces, because those had come out, Star Wars discs. But the second time, I got the Back to the Future trilogy. And I foolishly, uh, I didn't even sell them. I just donated them when I got the, I don't think it was the DVD, because I did get, there was a DVD release that came out that was like a big deal. And it had, you know, framing issues right away that they had to correct and things like that. But it was probably after I got the Blu-ray, the, like the first Blu-ray box set that dropped. Um... I, I was on this like, well, I can't have that many laser discs hanging around, so I need to thin them out. And I didn't have an IKEA Calax behind me at the time, um, so yeah, I foolishly got rid of them. Uh, they had a little bit of shelf wear and stuff like that, but thankfully, and a lot I got recently, there were some very minty copies of all three films. So we'll get into all three of them. But Back to the Future on laser disc is a must. I remember seeing the film. In theaters, interestingly, it wasn't something that I saw opening weekend. I, you know, back in the 80s, man, tentpole movies were sometimes tough to keep up with. Um, and, and we tried to see them all and you know, my family, but sometimes some would kind of, you'd have to wait a little bit longer. Uh, but yeah, it came out July 3rd, 1985, and was a huge event. But the cool thing I remember about this movie is we didn't get to see it until... Uh, it hit second run, believe it or not. There was this place called the Parkade Cinemas in Manchester, Connecticut. And uh, we went with my cousin and you know, my parents. And it was quite a ways after it's... It might have even been after the summer was over. Because um, sometimes these things would have such stellar runs that it would you know take... Um, like you'd have something like you know, Octopussy and Return of the Jedi in 1983 playing closer to Christmas. Or like you know, in between... You know, Thanksgiving and Christmas and the second runs because they had such legs in the uh, in the first run cinemas, which is something, you know, kind of alien to audiences nowadays who everything's just make it or break it in the first couple of weeks. But so, yeah, I believe it was later on in the year uh, that we saw this finally at the second run. And um, it was amazing. That's kind of this energy of, of these 80s movies is even though these movies were in second run cinemas, like there were there were people that hadn't and like lots of people that hadn't seen it. So you could go see a movie like months after its original release and still have almost an identical experience because it wasn't people, always people that were seeing it for the fifth time or something like that. It was still people seeing it for the first time. So you could have that same kind of like opening night rush repeatedly uh, throughout the run. I still remember standing in the lines around the block to see you know, Raiders of the Lost Ark in a tiny little 99 cent theater in Manchester, Connecticut, uh, 
when I also had to stand in line, you know, so many months before when I saw it, that one I saw right away. Um, but yeah, it was this great kind of great kind of moment. Um, and of course, this reminds me nowadays of Stranger Things because over the summer they had dropped um, over the past summer they had dropped season three, which the Back to the Future release was kind of a key part. It was you know taking place in the July Fourth period of nineteen eighty five, and it really kind of tapped into um, you know just the buzz about it. And it was so cool to see the show kind of aiming to recreate the buzz of a of a blockbuster summer eighties action movie, and and they did. But you know the only my only complaint was that they failed on capitalizing on that extended buzz because. You know, back then it wasn't just about the opening weekend. So they really, you know, the Netflix model of, of dumping an entire series in one day uh, definitely hurt that season. It should have been released in trickles of like two or three episodes and sustained that buzz throughout the summer. And that really would have created uh, like a replication of the buzz uh, over something like Back to the Future. This wasn't just a one weekend thing. And you're like, that was the best thing I ever saw on with my life. It was just a sustained fever pitch of awesome sauce. Um yeah, Robert Zemeckis directed the film, co-wrote it with Bob Gale, and it's still, you know, a, a high watermark in terms of 80s cinema. You know, it had that Steven Spielberg stamp of approval um, as an executive producer, but it you know, had that Zemeckis vibe. And again, he can push it too far sometimes, like sometimes the, the kind of gimmickry. Um, you know, there's some moments in this that, you know, kind of push the envelope just like in Forrest Gump, but... Uh, just the way it's structured is so impressive and the way it delivers information you know it, it makes you love a character like doc brown even though you don't meet him until about halfway through the film you just hear him as a voice on a phone and you meet him through his inventions um it's just yeah really interesting like what it tells you what it doesn't tell you what it tells you through like newspaper clippings and um it's just so well structured and constructed and you know you just have to pay attention because everything coming at you in the beginning of the film is information that you're going to need later and it's you know but it's done so um creatively and capably that it doesn't feel like uh you know an info dump it doesn't feel like someone giving just tons of expository dialogue you know just opening moments alone before you even meet michael j fox's marty mcfly um, it already tells you so much, so many of the the plot elements and, and the DeLorean of the film you know needs to work on. You you find out that uh, plutonium's been stolen. You find out who stole the plutonium. Like so much information is delivered just from a simple pan across one room, and um, the characters are delightful. And of course, this spawned you know countless imitators and you know, of course Rick and Morty and other beloved entities through the years. So there's nothing really I can say about Back to the Future that that you guys don't know. But um, I'm a sucker for time travel movies in general. Uh, I just love that concept of being able to mine the past with whatever knowledge you have of the future um, with you. So in some regards, I enjoyed two, even, I don't know if a little bit more. I always say that one's my favorite, but um, this one's still untouchable as you know, this kind of prime example of 80s summer blockbuster entertainment. Um, you know, it's a weird film you know, from the perspective of somebody that wouldn't know, like a studio executive reading a script. You know, you can clearly see like the only romance for Marty McFly's character is is potentially from his mother in uh, in her 1950s self uh, when he travels back to 1955. So on paper, it seems like a hard sell, uh, but in execution, it's fantastic. And, you know, Crispin Glover's great in it. Um, Leah Thompson's great in it. Alan Silvestri's music was you know, a huge part of what made it work. And I, I still remember sitting in that theater in 1985 and, and just, you know, just almost sweating. You know, the, the big finale, everything seems like there's so much on the line to make everything line up perfectly. And, you know, the DeLorean keeps stalling, etc. cetera. I just, you know, the, the tension was just palpable. You just cut it in the air. It was so, so, yeah, so much of a rush uh, when you watch this film. And yeah, it was, it was, it was next level. Spielberg, of course, dropped some great things in the 80s, too. But, yeah, I think Zemeckis really took the ball from him and ran with it with this. And, and of course, I, I loved the uh, Starlog article, which, of course, has been, you know, largely debunked now because I, I just love being able to kind of think too much about time travel movies. And there was a fantastic piece in Starlog magazine that, that was talking about how, um, you know, depending on the time travel rules of the movie. And, and the time travel is explained by Doc Brown in part two. Um wasn't explained quite well enough as to you know what exactly was going on so it made the starlog article seem even a little bit more plausible in that 
um, this was creating all these splinter timelines and at, at certain points there's like multiple Martys in one location and um, it was yeah really cool the, the way it broke down the finale of the film and everything like that but um, yeah and there, there's some you know the bits that are a little kind of weird like you know why would these people stand in front of a car coming to them at 88 miles per hour i mean you really have to have faith in the science to make that work um you know and, and like i mentioned before some of the the gags that are just put there um just to be gags you know forced gump moments like you know the the marvin berry phone call you know that never worked for me you know mostly because he holds the phone up after michael j fox has finished pretty much playing uh, Johnny Be Good, and he's just doing a crazy ass guitar solo that clearly didn't influence Chuck Berry in any way, shape, or form. Um, yeah, little moments like that, but it doesn't matter because you know the writing is just so on, and, and the characters, uh, you know, the writing's on top of its game. But the, you know the characters are, are really what propels this, and it's so cool, like how little information you're given about you know why Marty McFly hangs out with Doc Brown in the first place. Uh, there's plenty of clues that are given throughout, and um, yeah, it's great characterizations and. There's so much fun you can have kind of mining the film for, for details after the fact. Um, and yeah, there's the, the countless threads on online. You can get lost for days kind of thinking about Back to the Future. And um, yeah, the, the sequel I loved as well. And the third one, yeah, I enjoyed, but it didn't it didn't kick my ass like one and two did. But we're still going to cover it anyways on Laserdisc. So yes, the Laserdisc copy of Back to the Future. This came out on Laserdisc and Pan and Scan in 1986. And I say Pan and Scan, but the, the film was a 1.85 to 1 film. It was shot flat, which is, you know, you take an old 1.37 to 1 Academy ratio image, which is very similar to, you know, a television screen, 1.33 to 1. And uh, you mat it theatrically on the top and bottom with a, you know, a plate in front of the projector um, in order to create the, you know, the composition that you want. So that brought about the opportunity to you know go back to that originally you know full exposed camera negative to uh create a television print or a panascan laser disc print which this is not i don't know why i'm pointing to that um but yeah there's a lot of goofy kind of attention paid at those uh transfers nowadays because a lot of people believe that to tell us any engineers would go back and, and and capture the entire frame so that future generations could letterbox the film themselves by zooming in on it on their 69 televisions but you know when there was absolutely no um approach to composition or, or visual purity uh, the, the goal was to fill the four four to three television screen the best you could and so a lot of times you know the image was zoomed in a little bit um and then sometimes even manipulated you know far more beyond that but um the pan and scan is also definitely pan and scan in terms of special effects uh, because the special effects were shot with a different process and were wider than the 1.37 to 1, so therefore they are, you know, there's no extra imagery to deal with when you're making these television cuts. So they had to pan and scan some of the special effects scenes. Um, so yeah, that people still love that pan and scan version. And it's interesting how when you get the three films on Laserdisc, for some reason one of the three always ends up being a pan and scan copy. <laughs> Part of that is because even though this is the first film, this is the last of the three to be released letterboxed on Laserdisc. So a lot of that was people that had the original and then got them as they were released. And, you know, I always wondered why two, like the packaging was similar to this, but a little bit different. And that was because that was the first that was released. And then I think in November of uh, 1990, part three was released. And that looks very similar to this release. And that's because this came out in February of 1991. I believe it was February 7th. Um, I didn't pick it up right away, obviously, because I waited until, uh, you know, the Columbia House you know, deal arrived uh, a couple of years later, you know, 1993. Uh, interestingly, though, this didn't get a lot of love. Um, you know, there's, there's these big kind of, some of them other Amblin entertainment entities that didn't get the love they deserved. You know, this and Jurassic Park, you know, Jurassic Park at least got a DTS laser disc release, but there was never a, a signature collection release, you know why on earth would there not have been a signature collection version of the back to the future films um you know, why was there no dts copy uh you know this is this stuff was like primed for like a thx remaster thinking about the fans like crazy with this you know a la star wars or some other things but uh yeah it's interesting how this was just dropped letterbox on laserdisc and psh, everyone walked away and whistled um there were muse laser discs that were released and those you know of course cost a pretty penny um especially part three so there's that option but 
um, is, is really fascinating that there was no box set, there was no you know special edition gatefold CAV or anything like that. And this is surprisingly chapter free. Like they didn't really put that much effort into it, which is so weird. Why wouldn't you have this thing loaded with chapters? Um, it is MCA Universal Home Video number 41056 and does say letterboxed edition on there. And of course on the front as well for your edification. Um, you should read the Berkeley book, it tells you. It is encoded with stereo digital sound in addition to the high quality picture and CX encoded analog stereo soundtracks of conventional laser discs. And you know, it's got a couple of you know, pictures on the back thrown on there because you know, obviously there's no chapters or anything to that. And there's no write up about you know, the film's production history or anything like that. Just some uh, Gene Shalit and Kathleen Carroll uh, quotes and uh, a little bit of a write up. Uh, but yeah, it's one hour and 56 minutes, rated PG, extended play, so no CAV or anything like that. Uh, it is closed captioned and CX encoded, features digital sound in addition to the analog sound, and all the soundtracks are Dolby Surround encoded, so you can use a ProLogic receiver uh, to extract those surround tracks. And it does have the cool little letterbox edition thing on the back. It says the film on this laser disc is presented in the 1.85 to 1 aspect ratio. Of the original 35 millimeter theatrical prints, the black areas at the top and bottom of the image are normal for this format. Proportions may vary based on the monitor used for playback. Yes, you know, if you had some um, overscan or something like that, it would uh, it would change. It is a uh, Pioneer USA pressing, and it you know, looks clean. There's no problems there, um, no rot or anything. So uh, they they were crushing it. And as far as I know, there's no uh, pressing variations or anything like that. It's just Pioneer USA for all of these. This does also have the to be continued bit added at the end that was later removed, um, you know, because later on they, they threw that on uh, the film to prepare for part two, you know, because part two wasn't really necessarily a thing when this film was created and released. So they kind of added that to the, the home video versions later to kind of tie everything together. Uh, I mentioned in the brain scan review, uh, there was a bit in, um, in there that reminded me of another Zemeckis piece, which is go to the head of the class from, um, amazing stories. And I actually rewatched that a uh, laser disc in the wake of the brain scan review. And again, was just reminded at how much that reminds me of this film. You know, of course it, it's the flip side of back to the future in that all the characters are unlikable, you know, they're all kind of self-centered and, you know, <laughs> sex obsessed and just obsessed with vengeance and things like that. Uh, and it's got all sorts of occult imagery. It's, it was co-written um, by Bob Gale and, you know, Zemeckis directed it. And, but Mick Garris was also involved in the story in that case. Alan Silvestri did the music though. He strangely did it with, um, you know, all keyboards and things like that. So it didn't have a full orchestra, probably budgetary reasons, but um, yeah, it's a real, it's got a, a, a similar structure and a back to the future esque vibe, but in a Halloween ish fashion. So the characters obviously aren't as likable because uh, they're not meant to be. Yeah, I definitely recommend seeking that out on Laserdisc if, uh, if you can find a copy as well. This thing, despite the fact that it seems like there wasn't that effort put into it uh, in terms of chapter encoding and all that stuff, uh, looks fantastic on a, on a good rig. I watched this on my projector, uh, which I um, mentioned the, the kind of food chain in the uh the flash gordon uh video but the signal chain is um lds9 going into a uh, fruja nrs which is then going into a um dvdo edge green which is then going into splitting off from there there's a hdmi cable that's going into my uh, rotel processor and then the, the video is going out from there uh into my sony sxrd projector and um this is one of those things that actually um, shines when blown up to you know, big proportions. I zoomed in the image so I could fill the screen and uh, you know show it properly with edge to edge imagery. And um, yeah, it really looked fantastic. There wasn't a lot of problems in the imagery. Uh, it was clean print. Uh, the transfer seemed done well and just lots of detail, especially in the, the fabrics of the, the characters, jackets and things like that. There's a lot of... Um, crosshatch type uh, patterns in there that that just looked really sharp as a tack of course that helps the film is there's not a lot of long shots as the film is largely derived of close-ups and medium shots and everything so that helps with detail you know because everything's a little bit closer as so you can see um you know with details and characters faces and things like that but uh it just shined on a big screen like that I was impressed. I thought it was going to have a little bit of more diminishing returns you know blowing up a standard definition you know letterboxed image to fill an hd screen but looked fantastic you know the but the blacks on your set calibrated right like the nighttime shots at the you know the twin pines mall 
you know, there are lots of inky blacks and it, you know, it looks fantastic. And of course, lots of great daytime shots, you know, in Hill Valley in the center of town, both in 1985 and 1955. Um, a lot of vibrant colors and very sharp uh, for, you know, an early 90s disc. And uh, yeah, I didn't see any, you know, ringing or ghosting or any problems like that. I was, I was impressed. I was definitely impressed by, by how good it looked. Um, it's funny because after watching the Blu-ray and, you know, seeing some of the details of the yeah the, the the school with the graffiti on it and everything like that going back to this uh, it didn't really feel like i was taking that far of a step back in terms of detail i was like oh i can still make out all that stuff that you know really kind of stood out in high definition so it's a nice disc nice damn disc <laughs> i'm glad they put it out in letterboxd even though they had to wait until 1991 to do it um, better late than never for sure the audio as i mentioned is dolby surround encoded and um you know i listened to the digital track i didn't, I didn't fire up the um the analog but sounded great alan silvestri's music is big and full and energetic a lot of it's coming from behind there's of course stuff with the car there's effects zooming front and back sound stage and uh it's pretty pretty good in enveloping sound uh experience as one would expect from an 80s film with a lot of big budget thrown at it one of these amblin type features uh i should mention there's of course some cool Huey Lewis in the news tracks that rip it up on the soundtrack. Yeah, the opening of this film is just so much fun. After the opening bit with the guitar amplifier in Doc's, uh, <laughs> Doc's garage, um, you know, the opening bit with, you know, Marty traveling through town is great. You know, one fun thing about the, the, the center of town in 1985 is like, it's supposed to be modern and as it was when we saw it, but it's funny how like, you know, there's a porno theater in there and like, it's almost like halfway there to, you know, the horrible Biff centric version from part two. Uh, it, it is like the, on the way to, you know, it's not decrepit or anything like that, but it's on the way to like decay. And it's kind of interesting that that's like the, 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 the part you're like really supposed to kind of want to get home to, you know, Marty never feels like he wants to stay in 1955. Um, unlike a lot of other films like La Jete, 12 Monkeys, where, you know, Obviously, part of the draw is wanting to stay in the past somewhere in time. Um, you get addicted to the time that you land in, but it's so cool that you know, he really wants to get back to that you know Hill Valley with the with the porno theater in the center of town. <laughs> yeah, it's great. So many moments that uh, are uh, indelible. Um, just so many quotes. Uh, I quote the film all the time. Uh, something you should definitely have on Laserdisc. I mentioned before there are a couple different versions out there. There is a Japanese box set that came out in 1993. It also has a bonus making of disc, so we're going to review that at some point. And there were just a number of releases from different um, different regions, you know, PAL, NTSC versions. It's not like some of the other films I've been reviewing on Laserdisc. There, there are a lot of options for you for Back to the Future out there. Um, but yeah, if you're looking for the, the letterbox one, you can easily see it's got the, the star field there at the top and bottom and the... The bordering bars there whereas the old pan scan ones just got a, a kind of top blue bar like that and uh you know the artwork's obviously blown up a little bit bigger so it's easy to uh to recognize if you see it in the store shelf lddb mentions that this is 29.98 but i all the historical documentation that i found seemed to be indicative that it was 39.98 which makes way more sense of it being a you know a little bit higher price title that i would be yeah, prone to ordering from Columbia House as opposed to just going out and buying it myself. Uh, I suspect that maybe it was lowered in price a little bit later and that was what was entered into the LDDB. But um, yeah, as far as I know, it was actually $10 more. But yeah, I was really impressed at, at how good it looked and how good it, it scaled up. You know, the soundtrack it was just as good and energetic as I expected it to be. But the, the picture was the, the one I was a little bit surprised. I thought it was going to be really soft and, and kind of washed out. But should definitely do a, a commentary for that film because there's so many cool things about it, so many details I love, and um, you know, so many. And as time goes on, there's like bits like I always like was like, why do they go to the lengths to mention Doc Brown's luggage? And Marty doesn't mind that when he's in the past. And of course, you find out that they did. It was just a deleted scene. So, and you know, Bob Gale and Zemeckis have come out and explained some things or explained like what some clues mean or don't mean as time goes on. So it's like this film just keeps kind of yeah snowballing and becoming a bigger thing over time and you know and it's one of those films that interestingly I, I still feel like a buzz about the notion of owning it on home video I mean, this was when this came out on videotape obviously i didn't have a laser display in 1986 when the pan and scan copy came out 
um, but it was available on VHS, but not from sell through. You could go and rent it. And I, you know, vividly remember we had a, you know, a second VCR that we borrowed at one point so we could, you know, dupe some tapes. And that was one, you know, first times I encountered Macrovision and it was me messing up my copy of Back to the Future. And I was so disappointed. Um, so when it finally came out on HBO and I was able to tape it, I just remember like having a copy of Back to the Future that you could own and watch whenever you wanted in your house was this kind of big event. It was, you know, akin to owning Star Wars for the first time. And um, yeah, I have to say, even watching this Laserdisc like a week ago, there was still that kind of explosion to the back of my brain that's like, holy crap, I am freaking Back to the Future on home video and I can watch it whenever I want. So yeah, you should totally get it on Laserdisc. So thanks for hanging out, everybody. Cheers. <laughs>